Hi everyone, this is Ms. Mason, reading Counting by Sevens by Holly Goldberg Sloan. Today I'll be reading chapters 41 through 45. Chapter 41 Mai could not remember ever feeling this way. Maybe it was because her brother hadn't been scowling so often in her direction, and her mother hadn't been telling her to put her things away. Mai sat on a bed and appreciated that she had an actual room with walls and a door that belonged to her and to Willow at least for right now. Maybe it was the acorn. Willow had put it on her night table. The kid was slowly beginning to collect things. She had gathered the small bead-like pods that fell from the trees on Pelnfold Street. She found a white feather at the bus stop and a speckled rock in the gutter out front. Mai felt like it was some kind of beginning. She knew that any minute they would be told to pack up their things and leave. But up until the very second that happened, Mai was going to enjoy this new life. So she took long, hot showers, even though that was wasting water and bad for the planet. She arranged and rearranged her clothing at every possible opportunity, admiring the hangers and the shelving in the shallow closet. She stretched her arms out wide when she slept so that they dangled over the edge of the bunk bed, because now she wouldn't be hitting a face or slapping the back of a neck. Mai cut pictures out of magazines and put photos of people she didn't even know, but just liked, up on the walls. She found a box of red paper lanterns in an attic storage at the nail salon. She bought a string of Christmas light tr tree lights and threaded them through the round fixtures, which she hung then hung in the bedroom. It made the low ceiling come alive. And what she knew for certain was that the weight of the world no longer felt like it rested entirely on her shoulders. Hiro drove his taxi across town to the college bookstore. He stood in the long line at the cash register waiting to pay. Books were expensive especially textbooks. He held the two pieces of required reading for the introductory course in biology against his chest. They were both used. That was a good thing. Someone had taken a yellow pen and marked up one of the books. Hiro hoped that the right parts were highlighted. Just the idea that there were important sections of the books and other sections that didn't deserve the swipe of the yellow pen made his stomach hurt. Suddenly, he couldn't do it. He hadn't been in school in 14 years. Now, surrounded by so many young people, he felt so old. Ancient, really. He was 35 years old, but hadn't he recently found gray hair? Three strands. They grew on the very top of his head, in the center, shooting up from the thicket of black like the rebels that they clearly were. Those three hairs were outlaws with the confidence that one day they would conquer their world, which was his head. Hiro was almost at the cash register when he spun around. He should put the books back. Who was he to think he could take college courses? Why would anyone ever want him to work in a hospital? How would he pay for a degree? This was all just a big waste of time. Hiro moved back to the maze of aisles, but the large store was crowded and he suddenly couldn't remember where the books had come from. And there was no way that he was gonna just dump the textbooks on the wrong shelf. He wasn't gonna be that guy. Settle, new plan. Just buy the things. Owning them didn't mean he'd go to class. Maybe he could read the stuff in his spare time. Didn't he have to wait every day of his life for people? Who was he kidding? That wasn't happening. Could he give the books away as gifts? They were used in a yellow pen marks all over them. What kind of present was that? Hiro leaned back on his heels and allowed his eyes to close for just the briefest of moments. He needed to talk to her, his angel. She'd appreciate the textbooks. It was with her on his mind that he stepped back into the line for the third cash register. The young woman behind the counter rang up its purchases, and when he handed over the cash, she hesitated. Did she look surprised? People didn't seem to pay that way. The woman hit a button to make the register drawer open. Suddenly a light swirled and a buzzer went off. Everyone stared. At him? At the clerk? And the spinning red ball up front? What had he done? Hiro felt his face grow hot, and then he saw someone who looked official pointing in his direction. The cashier was giggling as she said, You are our one millionth customer. He had no idea what she was talking about. His expression was blank. She filled in with, You won! Didn't you hear about it? Hiro shook his head. Other workers were now assembling, and a man in a burgundy jacket appeared at his elbow. He had a pin on his chest that said, Manager. He held up a camera. 
Smile! Hira tried his best to make his quivering mouth form some kind of grin. And then he heard a voice from somewhere in the small crowd say, He won $20,000, man! And I was right behind him in line! Unreal! Hira looked around and realized that the cardboard triangles ascended from the ceiling all said, Anniversary Celebration! Be our one million the customer and win! A woman held her phone close to his face as she said, Can you tell us your name? Are you a student? What are you studying at Bakersfield College? He realized now that she was recording him. He managed. I'm a new student. This is my first time here. The crowd gave a collective groan, followed by laughter and chatter. His first time? Come on! I spent a fortune in this place. As the woman continued to question him, Hiro became conscious of the fact that he was smiling as he spoke, and he couldn't stop. After he'd filled out all kinds of forms, from the bookstore and from the government for taxes, they officially took his picture, this time holding a big oversized check. And then he was given the real thing. Everyone was so nice to him. He was slapped on the back and he shook hands with dozens of students. He hugged people he'd never seen in his life. Finally, as he walked back to his taxi, moving across the wide parking lot into the midday sun, he checked his watch. He'd been inside the place for almost three hours. But in his back pocket, folded in half in his worn shiny leather wallet, was a slip of paper worth a year's salary driving his taxi. And that money would pay for all the college classes he ever wanted to take. Chapter 42 Every weekend, Patty goes to a farmer's market on Golden State Avenue on F Street. She likes to be one of the first ones there. Today, Mai went with her because Patty's using Dell's car and they can get more things and she'll help carry the stuff. They're going to pick up two bags of potting soil for me at the nursery on the way back. The best way to grow sunflowers is in the ground, not in pots or planters. They have enormous tap roots that burrow deep. My plan is to start them off in small containers and then locate a place later for transplanting. Dell and I go through the big blue recycling dumpster in the carport and we find 23 containers for me to use as planters. We pick out an assortment of tin cans, a few plastic tubs that once held sour cream and spreadable cheese, and even a few milk cartons. I don't think I've seen Dell so happy as when he's rooting around in the dumpster. After we have what we need, we go to the laundry room and wash the cans and containers in the deep sink. Then Dell punches holes in the bottoms with a kitchen knife, which gets ruined because you're not supposed to use it for that. He doesn't seem to care. When Patty gets back with the potting soil, we're going to plant nine different types of sunflowers. But another thing happens when we're readying our potting containers. Sadhu Kumar, who rents his extra bedroom to Dell, comes down with three computers. Dell says, what are you doing with those? Sadhu is getting ready to toss them in the big blue bin. They're going into the recycle. I size up the machines. They don't appear very old. I ask, you can't fix them? Sadhu snorts like a horse might do. They are junk, not worth the effort. I look at the computers. Two are laptops. One is a larger desktop, but the same company makes them all. Sadhu Kumar is sort of an angry guy. I think he might have had a lot of disappointment in his life. It can turn a person bitter. I wonder if that's happening to me. Nothing's worse than a sour kid. You should save that for later. When you're old and it hurts to just get up from a chair, you have a reason to have a permanently pinched face. I make a note to myself to be sad and even mad but not 100% angry at the world. There's a difference. Now I ask Sadhu, so can I have the computers? Mr. Sour Bitter Man says, if you want junk, take junk. Del Duke looks offended. He says, one man's garbage is another man's treasure. Sadhu only seems more pained at that thought as he walks away. We're still waiting for the potting soil, so Del and I carry the three machines up to number 28, and right away I start to take them apart. I think that I might be able to get one working computer from the three. I see that it could be possible to use the logic board for the first one and the chipsets and the plugins from the other two. I'm not sure it'll function properly, but if it does, the computer will be a gift to Dell from me. He doesn't know that yet. I'm at the kitchen table separating the peripheral wiring when Dell Duke's cell phone barks. He's chosen a dog as his ringtone. It doesn't seem like what a cat person would do. 
It bothered me while we were cleaning up this place that I didn't find a single thing to indicate that Cheddar had ever lived here. This is a man who couldn't be bothered to throw trash away. I've been waiting for the appropriate time to bring this up. Once he's off the phone, I ask, Do you miss Cheddar? Dell looks confused. Say again? I repeat, Do you miss Cheddar? Dell's eyes narrow. You mean because Patty cooks Vietnamese food? I don't respond. He adds, What I miss is my meatloaf. I'm not going to follow up. Patty and my return, and we're ready to begin. Patty says she'd like to help us, but she's testing some kind of new nail polish, and it wouldn't be fair to the product to stick her hands in dirt. I'm surprised when Quang Ha comes downstairs to do the planting. He picks out a container. It's cloudy plastic and previously held strawberry-flavored imported Italian gelato. I must admit that judging by the shape, this is the most intriguing of our dumpster planters. It is rectangular, but has soft edges. Quang Ha is confusing because just when I'm certain he has sawdust for brains, he'll exhibit some real insight. He picked the best-looking container for a seedling. While he obsessively pulls off the stickers from the sides of the former gelato carton, Mai and Dell and I fill up everything else with the fresh dirt. When he's finally ready, I hand Quang Ha the cookie plan, which has the moist seeds, and I say, Plant three, equidistant, about an inch down. Maybe he doesn't hear me because he takes a single seed. I say, take three. He mutters, I only want one. I don't want to be bossing anyone around, especially him. I say, it might fail. They are only going to be in these containers for a short time. We're just starting out here. He will not be persuaded. I can't read his expression, so maybe he's making fun of me, as he says. I'm putting all my hopes and dreams into this one seed. That's how I want it. Dell is now watching. His mouth opens, and I think he's going to say something, but he doesn't. Mai then turns to her brother. We're doing this for Willow. Don't be a jerk. She wants us to plant three seeds. Quang Ha looks from Mai back to me. This one is mine. I'm not doing it for her. Dell turns to us. You two girls do your own thing. I get a lump in my throat. And it's not because Quang Ha won't listen or because Dell doesn't support my planting methods. I feel moved because they aren't treating me like I'll break into a million pieces. Maybe that means I'm on my way back to some kind of new normal. Chapter 43 I can focus again, if only slightly. It doesn't take long for routine to really fall into place. We all get into Dell's car every morning. We drove off Mai and Quang Ha at the high school, and then Dell takes Patty and me to the salon. Most days, Mai walks over after school, and then she and I ride the bus to the gardens of Glenwood. Patty stays later, but is home for dinner. Mai and I get things started for the evening meal. Patty can't just walk across an alley to cook anymore, and a lot of her dishes take time. This means that we're in the kitchen in the afternoon, which opens right up into the living room. I can't help but observe Quang Ha, and later Dell, when he gets home from work, and positions himself next to Quang Ha in front of the TV. The two somehow understand each other. Maybe because they are both on the outside of something. I'm invisible to them, unless it comes to Quang Ha's homework. I helped him with a math problem, which is how it started. I can do his assignments in a few minutes, but I take a lot more time than I need so he won't feel bad. I know that doing his schoolwork is morally wrong, so I try to explain basic concepts before I hand over the material. I can't say that he's a good listener. His only serious activity, besides watching anything on TV, is doodling. He draws cartoon-like people with large heads. Quang Ha has a somewhat large head. I'm not sure if there's a connection. Every day, Dell asks me when I plan to go back to middle school. I want to say, how does never sound? But I don't. Instead, I usually pretend to not hear or mumble something that has a few indistinct syllables. Today, Dell adds, there's a lot you're missing there. I can't help myself, I say. Name one thing. Dell looks confused, but it's not a trick question. I really want to know. I can tell that while Quang Ha is changing channels, he's paying attention. He can't stand high school. Finally, Dell says, you don't go to PE. I just stare at him. Dell's belly looks like he has a basketball under his shirt. Yes, he's lost some weight in the last month, but he's got a long way to go before he's any kind of athletic specimen. 
but it's as if he's some kind of mind reader because he says, I'm going to start running. Tomorrow is my first day. Quang Ha shoots him a look of total disbelief, but I'm the one who says, Really? Dell nods. I say, Are you training for something? Dell says, I'm going to be joining some teams in the spring and I want to be in shape. Quang Ha is giggling now, not laughing, giggling. It's different. It's suppressed and high-pitched and contains an element of disbelief. I've never heard Quang Ha giggle. It must be a very unusual sound because the next thing I know, Mai is out of the bedroom and standing in the hallway. What's going on? Quang Ha starts to answer, but he can't. He's a giggling mess. Somehow this form of high-pitched laughter is contagious because Mai is now giggling. She's watching her brother and whatever he's doing is spreading. Dell has had enough. He gets up from the couch and goes into the kitchen. I follow him. We stand there. We can still hear the giggling in the other room. I say, are you really planning on running? Dell mumbles a form of yes, but then he adds, but I'm not going to join any kind of team in the spring. I made that part up. I'm just going to run for myself. I don't think that's strange because almost everything that I pursue is for my own understanding or amusement. I believe having an audience naturally corrupts the performance. I might be self-justifying, but I say, I think that's a great idea. Dell says, let's go water the sunflowers. The next afternoon, Dell does run. He makes a big show of it, coming in dressed in what looks like a costume, not an athletic outfit. Quang Ha starts a giggling thing again. I manage to say, good luck out there. And then Dell's gone. He comes back in bad shape. He's soaked in sweat and he's red as he can be and he was only gone 11 minutes. I don't keep track of time anymore and I don't count, but I saw the clock on the stove when he walked out the door. I just happened to be looking in that direction when he came back. I say, how was it? Dell is breathing very, very hard. He holds up a hand. It's the international signal for stop. I give him some time to regain a somewhat regular breathing pattern. Finally, he says, very tough. I might be a little out of shape. From the couch, I hear the return of the giggling. I write a five-page paper on Mark Twain over the weekend for Quang Ha. He's very resistant to certain aspects of learning. I believe that he understands a lot of what's being taught, but he has no interest in doing the work that comes with the assignments. Maybe he's just too tired from his late night TV viewing. I don't think Patty realizes that once she's asleep, he turns the thing back on. He somehow got himself a headset, so the sound just goes right to that. I know because I spend a lot of the nighttime awake. Quang Ha is clever enough to delete the first paragraph of the Mark Twain paper and go through the computer file and misspell a dozen words before he prints it out. But it wasn't enough because he comes home today in a very bad mood. He's moved out of his English class and put into some kind of honors AP program. I will not take the blame for this. Chapter 44 Patty had to find something for Willow to do. It was the only thing to keep her from staring off into space. She didn't like the look on her face when that happened. The girl was so still, like a statue, or a dead person. In the nail salon, she could scare the customers. So Patty gave Willow the lease agreement for the salon, and the kid actually read it. She pointed out three areas with inconsistencies, and made a document for Patty to use when she next met with the landlord. It was impossible not to be impressed. When Patty casually said that she wished she had room to add another manicurist, Willow made a floor plan of the nail salon that optimized the space, moving the front counter and three of the four manicure stations. This opened up room for a new chair and a foot spa. Patty immediately took action. And the crazy thing was that it felt less crowded, not more, once they added the new person. But the kid was obsessed with the disease and infection. She saw problems that didn't exist and it grated on Patty's nerves. She finally told Willow to just write down all of her anxieties. The next day, when Willow handed her a detailed report on the incidence of infection for manicure and pedicure treatment, Patty got angry. She had never had a single complaint from a customer with a health problem. Patty avoided the 12-year-old for the rest of the day, sending her back to the apartment early. But then, that night, Patty had a dream. It was a gruesome nightmare in which her clients all keeled forward face first onto the manicure desks. The next morning, Patty asked Willow to talk her through the information. 
Her eyes glazed over when Willow spoke about new drug resistant bacteria, but she got the gist of the whole thing. That afternoon, new, more powerful disinfectant was purchased for the basins and the foot spas. Willow insisted that it never be watered down, as they had done in the past to make the chemicals go further. Patty had all the manicure stay an hour late that night, and Willow gave them a presentation in Vietnamese, which was impressive for that reason alone. The following Monday, once the changes were all in place, Patty let Willow post the 10 most important health rules that every nail salon should follow. Patty put Willow's manifesto on the front window, and she adopted the girl's proposed new slogan, setting the standard in California for health and safety in nail care. But Patty was still surprised when new customers began appearing. Willow had said that it would happen. Dell no longer ate meatloaf. He wished his mother was still alive because he wanted to tell her. He was certain that she went to her grave worried about his addiction to a compilation meat dishes. Hadn't he discovered a list in her address book written just weeks before she died? It read, 1. Find a pair of high heels that don't hurt my feet. 2. Cancel life insurance. 3. Get Dell to stop eating so much crummy meat. It had taken a decade since he first saw her spidering handwritten list, but now it was a fact. The meat obsession was behind him. He didn't cook his meals anymore, so he wasn't sure that he could take any credit for the change. But still, there had been other life improvements. He had a new computer. Technically, it was an old computer, or at least a machine made from salvaged parts, but it was faster and more efficient than any other piece of equipment he'd ever owned. Willow had made it for him. When he brought the new old computer down to number 22, and Sadu saw how it worked, the guy's eyes almost popped out of his head. It made Dell proud. Now he adjusted the pillows behind his back and opened his computer to a secret file. It was late and he couldn't sleep, but not like from before from severe indigestion. He didn't have a TV in his room at Sadu Kumar's, so he had to read or work. He clicked on the screen, and the Dell Duke system of the strange appeared. He needed to add a new category. Dell's finger slid across the keys and he typed in Mutant. Color code, blue, his favorite color. Next to Mutant, he typed the word Me. Dell shut the computer and stared up at the ceiling. He was changing. He was capable of that. He decided that all his life he had been influenced by things around him. Now he lived with a cranky man who was originally from Punjab. And he wasn't with him, he was down the hall with the Californian and Vietnamese. He was identifying. Since he was usually self-destructing, this felt so peculiar. But he knew that he was now different. And it wasn't just the little things. Sure, he now trimmed his beard. He raised the bar in his personal hygiene in a lot of areas. But that wasn't the mutation. It was bigger than that. It was on the inside. Because the truth was that, as frustrated and angry as he first felt, he had to admit that once his junk was all gone, and the rest of the things were put into some kind of order, he had started to feel stronger. Patty had taken over his apartment and moved him down the hall, but that too had an upside. Because for the first time, and as long as he could remember, Dell belonged to something. Even if he was the one they all talked about behind his back, it still made him part of the group. They were playing on the same team. Patty had fixed the buttons on his shirts, and had offered him a free pedicure at the salon with one of the girls who was in training. When he didn't show up, she scolded him, prompting Dell to clip his toenails down so close it hurt to even put on his socks. But then she gave him foot lotion and powder to sprinkle in his shoes, and made his toes smell fresh like lavender or something sweet, before his feet smelled pretty rotten. And then there was the running. That had started out as a lie. He hadn't planned on jogging anywhere. But now it had been two weeks. Every day after work, he came back to the apartment building. He put on the orange tracksuit that he'd had since high school. It didn't fit anymore, but he could still squeeze into the pants if he kept the waistband low. Then he set his watch for 22 minutes, and he headed out the door. In his comic books, the mutants had secret powers. It was possible, he now thought, that he did too. Hadn't he and Patty managed to take care of Will a chance? That was pretty powerful for someone who couldn't even keep a houseplant alive. Chapter 45 The sunflowers are coming up. 
We planted seeds in 23 containers, which have pretty much taken over the kitchen, and we have germination in all of them. I didn't make a chart and monitor the percentage of germination, because I don't do that anymore. But it crosses my mind, which is interesting. Dell and Mai are both excited when they see the small green seedlings. Before I can stop him, Dell gets all gooey and overwaters everything. Quang Ha acts like he couldn't care less, even though his single seed sprouted and already looks bigger than the others. I find a doodle of the seedling on a pad of paper near the TV. It's very precise. So Quang Ha had, had to have gotten very close and taken a real look at his new plant. In his picture, the seedling is growing out of the top of a man's large head. I'm not sure why this pleases me so much. I say, Quang Ha, do you think I could have this drawing? His eyes don't leave the television. He makes a noise which I can only describe as some form of grunt. Is that a guess? He waves a hand in my direction. I take it to be some sort of positive gesture because there are no fingers involved. I put the drawing of the man with the germinating brain in my room on the wall where I can see it when I roll over. Maya is very happy that I put something up, even if it's just a picture that her brother drew. She has been decorating since the first day we moved in. The Helianthus anise are fine for now in their containers, but they will need to be transplanted. Quang Ha hears me refer to the sunflowers in this way and laughs. Teenage boys are so easily amused. But very soon the H. Annis will, need all, will all need more space. I don't want to talk about relocation. It's too uncomfortable all around. My social worker has told me they are actively looking for a foster parent to take me. I've had three home visitation checks. All three were fine because we now all do live at the gardens of Glenwood. For now at least. I'm here on a temporary basis, but each day gives me more time to adjust to my new reality. So I need to be grateful. That's what I'm working on. Del comes over for dinner and we eat Boon Ri and Ban Kuan. I think Del is developing a real taste for food because he takes seconds on the rice bowls. I pick my way through the meal and when the timing seems right I say, I want to thank you all for what you've done for me. No one answers. It's like I pulled a rotten fish out of the refrigerator and placed it on the table. My words have a smell. Everyone goes from looking uncomfortable to embarrassed, and then Quang Ha just gets up and takes his plate and leaves the table. I knew he wasn't one of my early supporters. But they don't realize what a difference they've made for me. Or maybe they do and they're just keeping their knowledge to themselves. I go to sleep early, but I wake up every hour. In the morning I decide that I've done a disservice to myself in terms of my physical achievement. This is another way of saying that since no one thinks being motionless for hours is any kind of sport, I'm very challenged, athletically speaking. I think exposure to something new can't help but generate interest, even if you feel out of it and on your own planet. Dell comes in this afternoon from his exercise regime and he's red-faced and sweaty. He may be exhausted, but he looks alive. I'm interested in that. So I take a big step, I say. I'm thinking of running. Quang Ha hears me and his weird giggle returns. I don't look at him. I keep my eyes on Dell, who says, really? I continue. What I meant is that I would like to start training, and I was hoping you could help me. Quang Ha is really giggling now, and he's not trying to hide it anymore. But Mai comes out of our room. She shoots a hard look at Quang Ha and says, I'll do it too. And with that, our running education begins. I need athletic shoes. I only wear work boots everywhere, and you can't jog in those. Mai already has running shoes because she uses them in her high school gym class. The following day, she and I walk to the Salvation Army. She points to three shells with used shoes and then disappears to look at a raincoat. It really doesn't rain much around here, but Maya has strong feelings about fashion, and she spotted some kind of designer rainwear. I begin going through the shelves, and I'm surprised to find a pair of track shoes that actually fit well. The old me would have been obsessed about the possibility of a contagious medical condition being passed on from someone else's footwear. The new me has been a patient in a hospital and gotten a lot out of that experience. So my only objection is that the running shoes are bright pink with hot purple laces. Once I put them on, I feel like a flamingo. With the exception of the color red, I always wear earth tones because I'm blending into my environment. This is important for observation. But I'm not in any position to complain, so I smile with my lips closed and say that I say that the flamingo footgear is terrific. I don't normally use words like terrific, 
so maybe Mai will understand that I have my concerns. But she doesn't pick up on it. Our first day of running is tomorrow. When I get home, I work with Quang Ha on his biology. I give him a single-page document with a distillation of what he should know for his upcoming test. I try to come up with little tricks to help him remember things. I think it's possible that I have natural teaching ability. I'm not boasting. I'm just presenting the facts. He's starting to exhibit a degree of understanding. He tries to hide a recent pop quiz from me, but I find it in his notebook. He got a 91 out of 100. The teacher wrote a note at the top. Your new effort is paying off. I'm certain the last thing Quang Ha wants is to be some kind of biologist. But it's good to see he's not getting sent to the office or threatening to burn people with lab equipment. All of this leads me toward my own expansion. I go online and devise a running plan. I show Mai and she appears to be interested. She says we will go as soon as Del gets here, because he wants to come with us. I've charted out a one-mile loop that travels eight blocks south of the gardens of Glenwood. It then turns three blocks west, followed by eight blocks north, and finally three blocks east. On the map, it does not look like much. I'm lucky to still be alive. After two blocks on the course, I get a pain in my left side that feels as if a knife had been implanted just below rib seven. Individual ribs do not have names and are only referred to as one through 12, left side, right side. My legs, or more specifically, my calves, tingle and somehow I've lost all of my strength. My ankles freeze up. The air around me turns thick. I experience so many different health conditions, rapid heart rate, elevated blood pressure, dry mouth, pulmonary shock, muscle spasm, that it is impossible for me to even chronicle the degree of body breakdown. The shocking truth is that I cannot even continuously jog eight blocks south, which is the first segment of the run. At the sixth block, I stumble. I feel that I might lose consciousness, and there is no metal elephant table to break my fall. Mai places her hand on my arm and says, take it easy. Just breathe, Willow. I know it sounds crazy, but as I work to control my breathing, wheezing breathing patterns, something happens. I go from lightheaded to feeling grateful for the gift of life. It must be some kind of blood pressure phenomenon. Del and Mai walk with me back to the gardens of Glenwood. I want one of them to tell me I'll get better at this, but they don't. As we enter the apartment complex, they say, I'm going to try again tomorrow. I see Mai and Del exchange looks of concern. In that instant, I decide that I will exercise, time permitting, each afternoon for the rest of my life. Maybe I'm more competitive than I thought. I'm very sore from jogging every day this week, except for day four when I suffered some kind of setback and I had to walk the whole mile, almost on my hands and knees. I know I've made progress, but I believe it is fair to say that I will never be very good at running. Here is an even larger truth. I'm not in any way a natural when it comes to body movement. It is in this moment of clarity that I understand I've never danced. I know that I was forced to do some kind of folk steps to music in fourth grade, and I now realize that I was tragically uncoordinated even at that. It's funny how I'd block that experience out of my mind. In order to successfully transition from 12 years old to being a teenager and then an adult, I will need to be able to, will I be able to move my hips to a song? I'm sweating just thinking about it. That's why this running matters. I think that the effort put forth in matters of physical exertion is more important than the outcome. I'm not just saying that because gym teachers have told me this in the past. A new reality is emerging. I actually like my pink and purple flamingo shoes. So maybe the jarring movement of jogging is clouding my judgment. Even though my exercise regime only takes 16 minutes, I find that I'm thinking about it when I'm not doing it. I know that vigorous exercise changes brain chemistry. In my current situation, there is nothing more I could ask for.